I, uh, I mean, I think it works both ways. Let me say this, you know, we're well aware of this trend and we're monitoring it. Remember that prices go down when there's no one in the store and they go up when there are a lot of people, if you're doing dynamic pricing. Same thing with the, with the ride companies. Uh, it works both ways. I don't know that it have implication for, uh, you know, for inflation. It would certainly have implications for consumers who need to be informed. You think that this kind of surge pricing might lower prices overall? So, so, I mean, that's <clears throat> my my understanding is that the the idea is uh, that in slow in slow periods, prices actually go down, and in higher period in in busy periods they go up. But these are sophisticated economists working for these big companies, and they're not going to do things to to lower their profits. I you know I think the price mechanism is incredibly important in our economy. I think. Uh, we need to give companies the freedom to do that as long as they're, as they're not fixing prices or, or failing to disclose the, you know, the, the nature of the price changes to the public. I have a few seconds. Research has indicated constrained supply was behind a significant amount of the inflation we've seen over the last few years. If the supply chain, for instance, of autos had been more resilient or if there had been more housing availability, would that have made your job easier? Yes, <laughs> in a word. Yeah, a, a big part of the inflation was... And we saw it in 2023 when the supply chain problems unwound and when the, when the labor supply shock that we had unwound as well, we saw inflation come down very quickly in the second half of the year. But it, it, it's also down to uh, you know, uh, tight monetary policies playing a role as well. Which leads me to the, um, to the plea with you to speak out about inflation, about the contribution of corporate profits and greed to inflation. Thank you. Oh, I know you are done. That's true. Well, I was just... I was, I was, you find yourself agreeing with me more and more often? Is that yes, what? <laughs> that would be a nightmare, and I'm awake. <laughs> so what I would say, however, is that the fact of the matter is that so often, if in fact 60%, I actually listened to what you said, which was remarkable. Uh, the fact that 60% of Americans today can't afford a $1,000 emergency. I can't imagine how the average millennial affords a down payment for a home. I can't imagine how they take into consideration when they're looking at a snapshot of their financial future, fixing and repairing or having a plan for obsolescence that happens for every homeowner in the country. So I think the issue is far more complicated and would love to delve into that over the next four minutes and 18 seconds. But my first question is a combination between the challenges of illegal immigration and crime. It seems like every single week, there's another story of another city underwater attempting to feed and house millions of illegal immigrants and, ta and American taxpayers are footing that bill. Like I mentioned in my opening statement, just recently in Denver, we saw City workers having their hours essentially zeroed out so that the city could allocate more resources for the illegal immigrants. In San Francisco, they say that the average cost between San Francisco and Oakland, because of crime, is almost $4 billion. Couple that with in New York, you see Governor Hochul bringing out the National Guard and the state police to help reduce the impact of crime. At the same time, Mayor Adams says he needs more money because the state of affairs from illegal immigrants in the city is devastating the economy, scaring the citizens, and reducing the opportunity for business as usual to return to New York City. So my question is, can you explain how our economy is expected to continue shouldering the burden and the costs because of illegal immigration? And what, if any, information do you have as it relates to the impact of this surge of crime in our major cities on the economic outcomes of those cities? Because I heard the discussion that when you have more folks in the store, you have more shoppers, except for these days, when you have more folks in the store, sometimes they're just there to steal. 
So you quoted my uh, my statement earlier, and, th and it was an accurate quote for which I thank you. But I would say right before that, what I said was immigration policy, uh, very important, very much under discussion, and it's none of our business. We don't set immigration policy, and we don't comment on it. So, uh, the, But you commented on immigration. So my point, though, is that when you're going to tell a story, please tell the whole story, especially when the nation is frustrated by nearly 10 million folks by the end of this year coming into the country and having the kind of negative impact on prices, on crime, on the challenges that everyday Americans, especially Americans living in the poorest parts of America, face on a daily basis. So as you accurately quoted, I, I was referring, I said over time. So I yes, was sir. referring to the history, which, which with you agreed. So I wasn't, I was staying as far as I possibly could from the current political context. And, you know, I, it's really not appropriate for us. We're independent. We like to remain that way. And the way we do that, one of the ways is by staying out of, of political issues that we, that we really aren't assigned. And um, so the kinds of issues you're talking about are, are very, very real. I don't deny that, but they're really not for us. So the Fed does not consider the impact of 10 million illegal immigrants coming to our country and the costs associated with those illegal immigrants, nor do they consider uh, the impact on states like New York or California or Illinois, where the devastation of crime ravishing the poorest Americans has an impact. We don't, we don't take that into consideration. So, we, you know, we do, and, and so does the Congressional Budget Office, we do try to estimate population and we try to estimate the effect of immigration, legal or illegal, on the size of the workforce and on GDP. If you look at the, the Congressional Budget Office has, a, as you probably know, a detailed assessment of all the things like that. We don't really have a way, and, and you know, we do look at the finances in the aggregate of state and local governments That's and the hiring that they do. So that's something we look at, but we, we wouldn't do a very specific assessment like that. I mean, CBO would probably would, but we, we wouldn't do that. Thank you. <clears throat> this is Scott, uh, Senator Menendez of New Jersey is recognized. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, before I begin my questions, I, I want to celebrate that in the past year, we have seen the first Latino Federal Reserve governor and the first ever Latino Federal Reserve Bank president. These are historic milestones that show we are finally making progress, something that I have been at for quite some time, uh, to the leadership uh, of our economic institutions. Uh, so I want to applaud that. And uh, Mr. Chairman, I hope that progress can continue and extend to the rest of the Federal Reserve staff. Thank you. Uh, I agree with my friend, the ranking member, that when you tell a story, you should tell the whole story. Uh, Mr. Chairman, are, are you uh, aware of the Washington Post February 27th article that says the economy is roaring and immigration is a key reason? I don't recall that, but I would have read it. Let now. me read it to you. <laughs> immigration has propelled the U.S. job market further than just about anyone expected, helping cement the country's economic rebound from the pandemic as the most robust in the world. It goes on to say, economists and labor experts say the surge in employment was ultimately key to solving unprecedented gaps in the economy that threatened the country's ability to recover from prolonged shutdowns. Would you take issue with those statements? You know, there are a lot of adjectives and adverbs in there that you wouldn't see in, in, fed, in fed world. Uh, but the, the take out the adjectives and give me the, on the, yeah, the story. The story is, uh, I think, broadly that this it is that there was a very significant increase in the size of the workforce last year. And it was happening all during the year. And we were wondering what it was. And the answer was it was really two things. It was um, labor force participation, but it was also immigrate immigration. And if you look at the Congressional Budget Office numbers, it kind of makes sense because there, there was a lot of growth. Wages were coming down. The economy is is bigger, and that's those are probably in partly part effect. This is without making any judgments on immigration or immigration policy, but I think that's no, I, an economic fact. I'm not fact. suggesting that. I'm just suggesting the facts are yep. that we had uh, 10 or 11 million jobs that were going unfulfilled in our economy. Uh, they lacked the productivity that is necessary for success economically, and as part of that, clearly uh, immigration uh, helped fuel part of our revival uh, uh, coming out of the pandemic. In fact, those were the people who were the essential workers when the rest of us were staying home. Uh, so I agree we need to do uh, what is necessary to have a regularized border. 
but I also think that um, just to create um, the, um, the, the context of immigration as a, as a scourge uh, is absolutely wrong. Let me turn to another question. In my view, the sticky inflation we've been seeing in the housing sector is principally due to the massive nationwide housing shortage. The Fed's monetary policy report attributes the shortage to restrictive zoning, high interest rates, and tighter underwriting by banks. I would also add to that list underfunding of key HUD programs that shore up and expand our supply of affordable housing. If the housing supply shortage continues to grow, are we likely to see continued housing inflation? Yes, we are. And housing's already becoming less and less affordable for low and middle income Americans. According to the National Low Income Housing Coalition's 2023 out of reach report, a worker earning the minimum wage in New Jersey would have to work two full-time jobs to afford, uh, to afford a modest one bedroom rental home at fair market rent. Do you agree that increasingly unaffordable housing is a problem for the economy? I think there are two things going on. One is a longer term housing shortage, and the other is the pandemic effects and the associated higher interest rates, which are things that will pass through. When all that passes through and rates are normalized, we'll still have the underlying housing shortage, and, and it's going to be causing upward pressure on housing prices. Now, the monetary policy report noted that, <clears throat> quote, home purchases by low income households have fallen disproportionately more because mortgage lenders impose maximums on the ratio of a borrower's debt service payments to the borrower's income. I'm worried about how this dynamic will interact with the recently proposed capital requirements proposal, which according to analysis from the Urban Institute, would disproportionately increase the cost of mortgages for black, Hispanic, and low and income moderate uh, borrowers. Given this, isn't there a risk that if the capital rules implemented without changes, that it could make it even harder for disadvantaged borrowers to attain home ownership? There is a risk like that, and we're very focused on it. Rounds and uh, hopefully you're working to mitigate it. Yes. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thanks, Chairman. Uh, Senator Rounds from South Dakota. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Chairman Powell, welcome back. Uh, look, look uh, first of all, I, I've appreciated the way that you've approached the discussions <clears throat> in front of this committee, and I understand your desire to stay as neutral as possible with regard to <clears throat> the politics involved in an election year. But I do have some questions here, specifically with regard to the Basel III endgame proposal. Um, an analysis of that proposal um, uh, found that 97% were either opposing it or expressing substantial concerns. In the hearing last March on the Monetary Policy Report, you stated that the Federal Reserve is a consensus organization, <clears throat> and you said, and I quote, I will do everything I can possibly to do, I will do everything I can possibly to bring people together in consensus and have a capital framework that could be broadly supported. My question to that is, do you currently believe that there is a consensus on this capital framework? I believe that we will have one. I'm fairly confident that we will have such a consensus uh, when, we, when we do move forward. So, we could expect that you will probably not call a vote on the proposal until you believe that there is a consensus? I think that's right. I mean, we're just in the process of, of uh, digesting the comments and then making the appropriate changes. Thank you. Um, as you are aware, I've weighed in several times <clears throat> on the concerns that I have with regard to Basel III Endgame, uh, including uh, I'm concerned about the lack of transparency the negative effects on mortgage lending and home affordability by disincentivizing banks from offering high loan to value loans that primarily help first time home buyers and low to moderate income borrowers. I'm concerned that the proposal will make buying a home harder than it already is for many. Uh, and further down the road, I fear that it could disincentivize mortgage lending from the largest banks particularly with regard to the secondary market and their impact on even smaller banks that do business with them. Would you be willing to withdraw the proposal or repropose with significant modifications, particularly addressing the concerns that I and others have on this committee, raising specifically with regard to the impact, and I'm thinking of, of Freddie and Fannie in particular and, and what the impact might be. Um, what would you see as the process involving those particular issues? So on those issues, we're, we're well aware of and very focused on those issues. 
Uh, we haven't decided what to do about that yet, but we'll, we get it on those issues. In terms of process, we're not at the stage of making that decision. I will say if it turns out to be appropriate when we get to that point for us to repropose uh, parts or all of the thing, then we, we won't hesitate to do so. Okay, thank you. Makes me feel a little bit better because I, I do think there are some very serious problems that would occur <clears throat> if the Basel III endgame as proposed goes into effect. And I most certainly am hoping that the Federal Reserve will find a consensus on this. And it, and it sounds like that may very well include some significant modifications if it were to be brought at all. Is that a fair statement? I expect there will be material and broad changes to the proposal uh, before it comes back to the committee for consideration, the board for consideration. Thank you, sir. Um, let's just, you know, with regard to the economy today, a limited level of price growth is believed to help facilitate economic expansion, reduce the risk of recession, and help businesses and consumers plan. However, during the Biden administration, we saw inflation climb to 13%, and those prices are now the new norm. I know that you make it a policy not to comment on the administration's fiscal policy, but it is well known that I, I really do believe that high inflation and high prices have been a direct result of President Biden's policies, failed in many cases, that the Federal Reserve has, and that the Federal Reserve has limited tools to address some of the problems that these policies created. We talk about supply side versus demand side on these costs. What have been some of the unintended consequences from raising the federal funds rate as rapidly as you felt that you had to as the chair and as the committee? What are some of those? I know that we talked a little bit about SVP and the failure there, their inability to to look at treasuries and the increasing interest rates and so forth, but can you talk a little bit about some of the things that you've seen that, that were negative with regard to trying to respond to those high inflation rates? Yes, so um, high interest rates are, are hard for businesses, they're hard for people. They're the thing, that, they're the tool that we have um, to, to use to bring inflation down. And our job at this time, it, it, when high inflation comes, it is the Fed's job to restore price stability, and that's what we're doing. You point to the losses in banks. Uh, that was a very substantial thing, and obviously the supervisors, and that was us, uh, you know, didn't, um, didn't get to that problem. We were aware of it, but we didn't probably appreciate it enough. Another surprise, though, is that we were able to get this far and get inflation down this quickly without seeing a big increase in unemployment, and that's just a great result. That's just uh, a surprise. It's not consistent with the historical record, but it's a really positive thing. Thank you. And I would just know that the only tools you had available were demand side tools. Yeah, that's right. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. <clears throat> thank you. Senator Warner of Virginia is recognized. <clears throat> well, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Chairman Powell, it's great to see you. Um, you know, I would point out to my good friend from South Dakota, uh, I do think, you know, if we'd gone <clears throat> back a, a year to 18 months ago, nobody would have predicted a soft landing. Uh, and, and I know you're not ready to declare victory by any means, but the fact that um, inflation has come down, and I actually think some of the things uh, like the CHIPS bill, the infrastructure bill, and some of President Biden's policies have actually kept the economy growth rate at the levels that have um, uh, allowed you to bring down inflation without seeing a dramatic rise in, in um, un unemployment. And again, that'll be something we'll probably uh, uh, have the opportunity to litigate over the next eight or nine months. Um, I want to take my time on, on issues around less about monetary policy and more about uh, regulation. Um, you know, I think we can never presume that we're out of the woods on financial stability, as we saw with the New York Community Bank yesterday, the stock plunge and the capital infusion. Um, you know, one area that I raised with you a year ago, I want to re-raise today, and, and that is um, non-bank Lending, um, the fact that non-bank lending in terms of to non-financial firms now is actually e exceeding regulated bank lending. And let me be clear, I've got, you know, the non-bank financial sector has done productive things in, in our society over the years. But uh, when folks like uh, former New York Fed President uh, Dudley and former Fed Gro uh, Governor Grosner recently said that um, they had worries about this reliance on the non-bank financial sector could lead to overall economic lack of stability. I guess, uh, what do you think 
I've got a three-part question. What do you think are the risks as we see this push-out effect of, of more and more lending going outside the regulated perimeter to the non-bank sector? Um, how much do we really know about these institutions? And one of the things, uh, they have very smart, sophisticated investors, but if those very smart, sophisticated investors said, well, hey, we don't like the lending profile right now, and we want you to not make any additional loans for the next six to nine months, um, do you think our system would be able to pick up the slack? So um, we have the regulated banking system where you've got a lot of transparency, you've got deposit insurance, you've got uh, access to uh, you know, the discount window and all those things, regulation. If you go outside that, most of the funding that we see now in these vehicles is sophisticated investors who are actually limited partners, mm -hmm. meaning they can't pull their money out. They, they're, they've signed a contract, they've funded these deals. And so what you see now in the non-bank financial sector is, is a sig significantly, it's, it's that kind of thing. So it's, it doesn't have the run risk. The, the, the point is the bigger it grows and the more diverse it gets, it is happening outside the regulatory perimeter and you worry that you, when, when there is another crisis, you'll be surprised, but there will be ways that that, that that financial structure too can break down, and it does break down in ways we don't anticipate. So I think we need to be smart about the way, uh, about intermediation is absolutely moving out of the banks, into the capital markets, and into non-bank financial institutions. That's what's been happening for a long, long time. I just think we need to be thoughtful about understanding where the risks are emerging. And, and that sophisticated investor may rightfully say, hey, we don't want you to lend anymore for a X period of time. But that may then, at that moment of crisis, mean that the, the lending capabilities completely dry up. And I, one of the things I never completely understood until I got a little better explanation recently, why the large regulated banks weren't more complaining about this non-bank lending, but I, as I got to understand a little bit more of the, um, and again, I'm not per se criticizing on the non-bank lending, but many of the regulated banks actually lend to these large institutions, so they make, you know, they make money off of those relationships, and maybe that's again an explanation of why they're not being more, more critical. I only got 40 seconds left, but I would like to come back to uh, another thing that we've talked about a lot, um, and that is the question of use of the discount window. Um, I believe one of the original tools that the Fed had, uh, I know banks say, well, we're, we're concerned about the stigma. I've got some legislation that would actually require uh, mandatory use uh, of the, the discount window. I'd love your comment on that. Uh, and also just the idea that having the, the mechanics of the discount window open, potentially even 24-7, because we saw what SVB, they one, they didn't know how to use it, but two, uh, if they wanted to use it in the non-bank hours, could they get access? There's a lot of work to do on the discount window. You're absolutely right. It needs to be brought up technologically into the modern age. Uh, we need to do more to eliminate the stigma problem, and we need to make sure that that banks are, you know, actually able to use it when when they need to use it. And and you know, those things. Uh, that that's a that's a broad work program that that we're we're on right now, and. Uh, it's very important. I know you're working on it, but I would look forward to working more, and I'd invite other colleagues. I really do think um, before we start adding a whole host of the other regulatory uh, issues, we ought to use some of the tools that are out there. Um, you, you're not gone. So God, I just I, checked I, in at the Veterans <laughs> Committee. Senator Tillis, North Carolina. Thank you, Mark. I was about to take control, Senator Warner. Yeah. <laughs> um, uh, welcome, Chair Powell. And uh, Gus sends his regards. If you have time after the hearing, you ought to go by and see him. He's a dog in our office. But I don't, uh, want, I don't want to disturb his nap. But, uh. <laughs> but uh, thank you for being here. I, I, uh, I want to get back on this Basel III proposal. Senators mm -hmm. Lummis, Coons, Gillibrand, and I sent a letter um, in, indicating our concerns with the current proposal. But I think it's also worth noting that the number of other organizations, a diverse group, that are not normally aligned on <clears throat> policy. you got bank trades. National Housing Conference, NAACP, Habitat for Humanity, uh, National Community Reinvestment Coalition, the list goes on, um, who have concerns with the current proposal. Uh, here's my concern. Um, I, I think we're, you know, we're trying to make the best of what was foundationally a bad proposal. And so I'm in the category of people who think that it should be reproposed uh, because I think 
one of the reasons why I, I did not uh, support uh, Mr. Barr's nomination is I felt like we were going to be here. I mean, it was pretty clear to me before he ever got confirmed on the board that we were going to be in this place some months or years later. And here we are. And I think that the industry felt the same way. All, all of these stakeholders, some of them are in banking trade, some of them are on the other side of, of the uh, spectrum. Um, so I, I'd like to cast my vote uh, or provide some weight to the idea that we should repropose it. And what we ought to do is talk about uh, the reality of, of increasing capital or the, the, the prospect of increasing capital requirements doesn't concern me. I, I think the uh, prior uh, Fed supervisor made a co had made comments publicly that maybe we needed to raise capital standards. But, but what we did hear in this proposal and I heard in that dialogue is let's deal with puts and takes. Let's, let's talk about raising uh, capital requirements, but let's also talk about reducing the cost of the regulatory burden today if we can do it responsibly. There's no evidence of that in the current proposal, and I think that that may actually produce a different set of comments that would be instructive to uh, a final proposal that I think realistically will include some increase in capital requirements. Um, so over what time horizon do you think uh, we would expect to either see try to make the best of this foundation or go back and take a look at a, at a new foundation and uh, repropose it? You know, we're going to work through it as quickly as we can and should. I will say it's more important to get it right than it is to do it fast. We're not in a hurry. Um, but uh, my guess is we'll, we'll work this out over the course of this year. Yeah. Well, I, you know, if you take a look at the outsized cost of operational risk, the, the, the long list of concerns that I have publicly and, and privately expressed on the current proposal, I, I do think sometimes uh, it's easier to uh, knock down a, uh, what I think is a poor foundation and build a better house. So again, just wanted to uh, make that comment publicly. I got a question about shrinkflation. I tell you uh, some of these words that we come up with, but, uh, you know, <clears throat> President Biden's using the idea of shrink inflation and, uh, you know, chastising manufacturers for creating smaller uh, portion sizes for potato chips. I'll use that as one example. But um, it, if, if you have rising input cost um, and you're, you're not able to control that and you're in a marginal business to begin with and now you're saying you can't even reduce the quantities, uh, how does a business that's not making a profit make that work? You know, I, uh, I mean, we see inflation as in, at the aggregate level as a mismatch between supply and demand. Yeah. And as we've seen supply get better yeah. and we've seen demand cool off a bit, it was very yeah. hot coming out of the pandemic. We see inflation coming down. We saw food inflation or we saw food inflation between 2010, 2021 <clears throat> at 18 percent over 11 years. And over the last three years, we've seen it at 21 percent. Um, I, I think that we have a a industry that's trying to actually provide products that uh, that consumers want and now they're being chastised for trying to figure out how to make the numbers work so I, this whole idea of shrinkflation is just confounding to me i have a i'm going to submit some uh, for the record i want to say on time um, but i have a question i, I think the chair mentioned uh, and I, if i misunderstood this i'm sure the chair will clarify it, but i thought in his opening comments he he uh, suggested that stock buybacks and paying out dividends were a key factor in inflation. Uh, do you, as just a matter of policy, see stock buybacks and dividends as one of the top five reasons we're experiencing the inflation we have right now? First, I guess I see stock buybacks and dividends as just the same thing in a different form. And I, I don't know, I wouldn't comment on anything that you even may have said. Yeah. Well, I just, I don't, I, I'd like to avoid that. I, I just, I, I don't think, I'm not going to ask you about policy because I think you're consistent on that, but I, I just can't imagine that if we decided to outlaw stock, buy, uh, stock buybacks and uh, dividend payments, that, that would have a, a, a material effect on inflation. So I'm, I'm not going to ask you to respond to that, but there are some people that by inference, you can, you could assume that that's, that they think that that would be helpful. I, I just, for one, I'm not an economist, but I just can't imagine that it would be, you know, one of the things that would make your job easier. Can you at least opine on that? Banning stock buybacks and dividends? Yeah. Yeah. I think that would be quite a change in our capital markets. It yeah. Me yeah. too. I mean, shareholders, th this is just money going back to shareholders from companies Me too. that have nothing to do with it. Okay. So. Thank you, Mr. Chair. <clears throat> Well done, Senator Tillman. <laughs> Senator Smith of Minnesota is recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chair. 
And uh, thank you, Chair Powell. It's great to see you um, here again. I appreciate your testimony. And I'm going to focus my questions on housing and housing affordability. Um, as you have um, well pointed out, overall prices have moderated considerably since the Fed began raising rates, um, yet housing costs have remained stubbornly um, resilient or high, leaving us really no closer to addressing the affordability crisis that I think that we have, and this was, was there well before the pandemic. Um, shortly before the Fed began tightening, Chair Powell, and you came before the committee, I asked you about how higher interest rates could exacerbate this unaffordability problem that we have by making mortgages more expensive and also hindering housing development. And I think that at the time you argued that we have a excess housing demand during the pandemic and that was kind of at the root of higher costs and that your goal, the Fed's goal, was to bring demand closer in line with supply. So my question, my first question is this. So the housing market has cooled significantly over the last two years. Is it your view that we it has cooled enough so that housing supply and demand is better in balance? And following on that, you know, given the Fed's limited tools, understanding that, at what point do, will you think that you've done all that you can to lower housing demand? Um, my view is that we're well past time in Congress to take action on the housing supply side, but I'm, I'm interested in how you see this dynamic. So we're not, you know, we're not focused so much on housing and housing inflation. We're, we're really focused on the aggregate, which is also yep. goods and not housing services. That's that's way more than half in the, of the PCE inflation. The thing, there are things that in, in the housing sector that uh, that we didn't fully anticipate. One of them was one of them just was that people in very low interest rate more homes with very low interest rate mortgages aren't selling. Right. So the quantity of homes that's available is incredibly low, and that's why it's very little in the way of, of existing home sales. And that drives up existing home sale prices, but also new new home sale prices. So the, the, again, there's two sets of factors. It's the longer run issue, but then there's the, the factors associated with the pandemic and the inflation and our response to it. I, I think as the overall uh, inflation continues to come down and rates then come down, you'll see the housing market start to heal and get better and housing affordability should go up again. But you're still gonna be left with, with, with the longer term problem of supply. Right, right, I, I, I think that's right. I mean, what I see in Minnesota is that um, higher interest rates are of course driving up the cost of construction. They're um, driving up the cost of mortgage rates. You're seeing people who aren't leaving a house that maybe is a little too small for them because they can't afford it, that the housing, you know, just as you're saying, people are staying in their, in their homes longer. Um, and so there's sort of this double whammy of construction slowing at the same time that there is this um, great need to address housing supply. One of the things that you know is happening, it's interesting, a recent analysis by Zillow found that the monthly mortgage payment um, on a, on a, on a, let me get this right, a recent analysis by Zillow found that the monthly mortgage payment on a home, on a $343,000 home, assuming 10% down payment, is about $2,200 a month. Okay, so $2,200 a month, that means the cost of owning a typical home is higher than 30% of median income, which is kind of the measure of affordability. And so we've got a lot of issues with people just being priced out of the home, of the housing market. Um, so from where I sit, the cumulative issues of higher mortgage, mortgage rates are just really um, a challenge. And until we can get to the bottom of that, we're gonna have a hard time um, addressing the um, the, the, sh the, the housing affordability challenge that we have. Would you like to comment on that? Yes, I, I agree with all of that. I mean, we don't actually, home prices don't actually go into the calculation of inflation. It's really rents and right. owner's equivalent rent. But you're, I, I agree the housing market is in a very, very difficult situation. And, you know, the sooner we can get back to price stability and restore interest rates to lower levels, the, the sooner it can start healing. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, thank you, Senator Smith. Uh, Senator Kennedy of Louisiana is recognized. Um, Mr. Chairman, thank you for being here. Thank you for your services. I think I've <clears throat> said before, um, I believe you and your team probably saved the world economy during the pandemic economic meltdown when the whole world wanted dollars by establishing uh, the currency swap line. So I thank you for that. You gave an interview 
Mr. Chairman, on February 4th of this year to CBS, 60 Minutes, I think. Is that right? Yep. I ordered a uh, transcript of that hearing, which I read. I learned a lot reading it. Um, you, were, you were asked a question about inflation, <clears throat> and you asking you ask a question a question about prices declining. And here was your response. I'd like to quote you, if that's okay. Um, quote, so the prices of some things will decline. Others will go up. But we don't expect to see a decline in the overall price level. <clears throat> that doesn't tend to happen in economies except in very negative circumstances. End quote. Did I quote you accurately? I believe you did. Okay. Um, later in the interview, you were asked about the national debt. Do you recall that? I don't, actually, but I, I, I'm sure that's right. Okay. Well, at least according to the transcript, your answer was, and again, I'm quoting you, in the long run, the United States is on an unsustainable fiscal path. The U.S. federal government's on an unsustainable fiscal path. And that just means that the debt is growing faster than the economy. So it is unsustainable, end quote. Do, do you remember saying that? I've, I've said that many times. I think that's uh, uncontroversial. Okay. Um, later in the interview, you said, I want to quote, you know, I would just say this, integrity is priceless. And at the end, that's all you have. And we in, we plan on keeping ours, end quote. Is that an accurate statement? Yes, it is. Okay. That's why I want to ask you about the FDIC. <clears throat> have you uh, read, read the article um, in the Wall Street Journal entitled, quote, Strip clubs, lewd, lewd photos, and a boozy hotel, the toxic atmosphere at bank regulator FDIC, end quote. I think I did read that a couple months ago. Uh, did you read the article entitled, I quote again, FDIC lawyer stayed on <clears throat> paid leave for weeks after child porn arrest, end quote. I don't remember that one. Okay, did you read the article entitled, also in the Wall Street Journal, quote, FDIC chair, known for temper, ignored bad behavior in workplace, end quote. I, honestly, I don't. I read so much. You know, I, I can't, sp I remember the whole, the broad story, but not particular okay. stories. Did you read the article <clears throat> in which a, uh, a former female employee of the FDIC allegedly recalled her male colleagues saying women needed to use sex to get ahead at the FDIC? I do not recall that, no. Okay. Did you read the article um, in, in which a, a, a female risk management examiner during a lunch with a male examiner said she had become friendly uh, with that examiner, and he complained to her about his marriage, allegedly, telling her he wasn't getting enough sex. And she allegedly said, quote, obviously if I walked, or he allegedly said, obviously if I walked into this office and you were naked, I'd fuck you right here, end quote. I do not remember that, and I think I would. Okay. Do you remember the article about uh, Mr. Randall Ditch, a supervisory examiner in Denver, uh, who allegedly was demoted in 2014 to a non-supervisory examiner position in, in uh, Tulsa after having sex twice with a subordinate female employee and a number of other rule violations. In this article, it says, allegedly Mr. Ditch had urged the, the woman to not, quote, be a pussy close quote, and drink a shot of whiskey during work hours, the records show. Do you, do you recall I do that? Not, I do not recollect okay. that. No. Here's my question. I could go on for a while. Could go on, but you're not going to go on. So you've passed your five minutes. Do your question once. <clears throat> Sir? Senator Kennedy, your time's already expired. You can do one. 
you did five minutes, consumed the whole five minutes with your monologue of... Well, you did six minutes. <clears throat> I timed it. I, I asked my... You did six minutes. Senator Kennedy, for months, I have let you go way over the five minutes. You get your question, your... Wait, but you did six question. minutes. I chair this committee. I understand. You still did six minutes. Check the record. I'm going to order. You're going to be at six minutes and 15 seconds if you continue this argument. Well, or you're going to ask your question. I'll ask my question. I just wanted the record to be clear, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chairman, um, in light of these allegations, if they're proven, how can the FDIC lead this charge for Basel End Game 3, which is going to turn the banking community upside down? I don't, I don't know how I would make the connection to Basel III. I'll say it's, it's deeply troubling things, obviously, but again, you, you know, as you, your point was, if proven. And uh, I mean, I, I think we have to decide Basel III on its merits. And we're, we're not looking to the FDIC to lead this, by the way. We're looking at the Fed to do what the Fed thinks is right. That, that's what we're going to do. We, we don't look to, and they don't look to us to lead them. Thank you, so. Chair Powell. Senator Butler is recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. <clears throat> Senator Butler is recognized. Thank you so much, uh, Chair and uh, Chair Powell. Good to see you in, in person, and thanks for the time to talk. I want to pick up a little bit where uh, Senator uh, Smith uh, was uh, in relationship to housing, housing affordability, and, and hopefully draw a little bit on the point that you were making about rents. Um, it definitely uh, is uh, an important crisis in, in my state of California, and I know across the country, um, where, uh, at least according to the California Department of Housing and Urban Development, uh, renters in San Diego are paying about 50% of what mm. is, uh, they're spending more than 50% of what is considered affordable uh, and statewide. The majority of renters, more than 3 million households, uh, are spending more than 30% towards rent. Uh, nearly one-third, more than one in five million households pay more than 50% of their income towards rent rent. Uh, and the Chicago Fed President Goolsby uh, even referred to housing as a missing piece of the puzzle uh, in the Fed's path to lower inflation. So to the, convert, to, uh, the uh, continued conversation, and I know a point that you've made that about uh, how inflation has a disproportionate impact on lower income households uh, who are focused on spending more of their monthly budgets on housing. Uh, is there, uh, how is the Fed's monetary policy impacting the supply of affordable rentals? I don't know that we're affecting the supply of affordable housing. If, if you think of affordable housing as something that's got connected to some sort of government program, we don't, that's not our, um, our bailiwick. I mean, our clearly interest rates do affect the affordability of housing, though. And, and there was a key point that you made in, a, in an earlier um, I think reference about, about and in your response to, to Senator Smith about the monetary policy and the calculation of rents. Can you just spend a couple, just briefly talk uh, about that? I want to have one last issue I want to get to before I run out of time. It's hard to talk about it briefly. It's actually very conceptually challenging to think about ha housing inflation. Do you include the, the costs of financing it? Do you include the, the you know, sale prices? And the answer is we don't. We, we convert ownership into an imputed rent and that's two thirds of homes are owned, and then we actually measure rents. But you know, but leases only turn over once a year. So you you look at market rents, and then, and and you know what's happening with newly signed leases may be very different from what was happening a year ago. So it's a, it's complicated. But the good thing is it, we understand all that, and we look through that. We look at housing services overall as one of the three important categories, along with non-housing services and and goods inflation. Thank you for that. Um, and uh, I, in the in the line of affordability and housing, again, sort of uh, very general, I think, to the broad uh, monetary policy and state of our economy, and unique to to California. Um, and I raised this uh, with uh, Secretary Yellen when she was here uh, as well, the uh, insurance gaps that are presenting themselves due to the impact of of climate change. Uh, and uh, where uh, one in five residents in California live in areas of that risk flooding, and all 58 counties have a history of flood damage. 
Uh, and we are seeing more and more insurance providers, home insurance providers actually withdrawing from, from the state. You and I had talked a little bit about, um, about this in, a, in our in our preparation for today's conversation. Um, can you talk to me about uh, or share with us how it is um, that you or what you think the impact might be of this sort of protection gap in insurance coverage on the overall stability of financial uh, institutions in the broader economy? So it is clear that, that insurance of various different kinds, housing insurance, but also automobile insurance and things like that, that's been a significant source of inflation over the last few years, and it's to do with a million different factors. It's nothing that we control from a regulatory or a supervisory standpoint. Um, you know, the, the, in the longer term, um, companies are withdrawing from writing insurance in some coastal areas, and you've you got to think 10 years from now, how are you going to get housing insurance? And, you know, maybe the government will have to step in, but it's, uh, it's a significant issue. Thank you, Chair Powell. Thank you. I was, <clears throat> oh, uh, Senator, his, his next, yeah, Vance. Uh, Senator Vance of okay. Ohio is recognized. Uh, thanks, uh, Mr. Chair, and uh, my gratitude to you and the ranking member for doing this hearing, and thank you, Chairman Powell, for being here. It's good to see you again. Uh, I think these, these, these hearings are always very important, actually give us an opportunity to sort of provide some oversight uh, to what's going on at the Fed and better understand some of the things that you guys are doing that, that affect um, our constituents. Now, I wanted to sort of focus on the Basel III uh, regulations, Chairman Powell, and uh, specifically the way that they have um, – there have been various proposals to sort of draw them down uh, to, uh, to focus on the regional banks. And to just go back to sort of one of the, the, the most significant crises, obviously, in our banking sector, uh, of course, the collapse of, of SVB and First Republic. You, know, you and I have spoken in, in private and I believe in public, but you know, one of the concerns that I have is when we talk about increasing capital requirements on the banks – if the banks were under higher capital requirements in the run-up to the crisis, there's maybe an argument that SVB, for example, would have bought more long-term treasuries, uh, which would, of course, would have exposed their balance sheet to even more uh, treasury uh, bond risk. And that, of course, would have maybe hastened the collapse of SVB. And I, I, I guess I want to start here with, you know, when we talk about, um, you know, some of the, some of the Basel regulations, what was the original intent? In other words, what, 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 what was the original sort of proposal for which banks would fall under those regulations and which would escape them? You mean this time around or, or I mean earlier on? Th th this time around. So it's the 37 largest banks. It's down to, uh, well, there's, there's four categories of banks, including the GSIBs, and this is down through, through the fourth category. We were, the original, the proposal that's out there now I think does extend to category four as well as three, two, and one. So what's the what's the minimum assets under management that you guys have proposed the current billion. Basel regulations? Hundred billion. Hundred billion. Yeah. Um, and sort of that that sort of gets to my to my concern here because I know there's some discussion about whether you'd apply them at seven hundred billion dollars of AUM or one hundred billion dollars of AUM. And maybe you could just sort of walk me through that decision process at the Fed where you guys are and what would sort of justify drawing down from a $700 billion threshold to a $100 billion threshold. So there's, you know, there's the GSIBs, there's, this, there's the eight identified GSIBs, and then there's, the, there's one category too, I guess, and then there are the big regionals, and those tend to be, you know, well-known big regional banks, and they're category three, and one of them's a two, I guess, but they have a different, they have a different uh, tailored level of regulation than category four, had significant tailoring, and the question is, you know, we have to ask the question, since SVB was a Category 4, we've got to ask the question, what, what, if anything, needs to be changed in the way they were regulated, supervised from a capital liquidity standpoint. So there, there was tailoring all the way down, and then below 100, of course, those are community banks, and that's a, that's a different regime as well. This makes sense. We want to have, you know, we want to have a diverse banking sector. That's a great benefit to our country, and, and very unusual for an advanced economy. So it's something we want to preserve. Yeah, and I, I, I'm sure you know, Chairman Powell, but just to put this on the record, I mean, a, a lot of the commercial lending, a lot of the real estate lending, a lot of the consumer lending, about half of that lending, uh, consumer lending, is provided by uh, the regional banks. I believe the Huntington in my home state of Columbus uh, is the number one SBA lender in the entire country. So these, you know, to your point, I think these do provide incredibly important benefits to our economy. And, you know, you hear a lot of people talk about the American economic miracle, and I do wonder if part of that is because we don't have the same type of financial system that 
has sort of dominated in Western Europe and in other first world economies. Um, I, I'm curious, in, in the process of amending the Basel requirements, are, are, are I mean, have you guys made a decision about where to set the threshold yet? And when do you expect to set that threshold? We haven't made any final decisions. We put out for proposals some right. months ago, uh, a proposal, and we've gotten a lot of comments, as I'm sure you're aware. We're chewing through those and digesting them, and uh, we're just at the beginning now to sit down and talk about the changes that we'll, that we'll appropriately make to the original proposal. And when do you expect to sort of issue a final proposal? I, I think it's going to take some time. Um, I think it's more important to do it right than it is to do it fast. My guess is we'll get through this and, and be done over the course of this year. But okay. I, it could be faster than that. It could be slower than that. So I'm, I'm wondering, just get, being mindful of time, I have about 30 seconds left. Uh, would you be willing to commit to, um, to say that in the process of amending, the Fed will remove the regional bank drawdown and limit Basel's application directly to the GSIBs or $700 billion or above? I, I can't get that specific at this point, but... Um, you know, we're, we're clearly looking at the whole tailoring okay. issue. I appreciate that. Uh, and, I, and again, I, I just repeat, Chairman Powell, given what actually happened with the banking sector, with SVB and First Republic, uh, I just encourage you guys not to apply a regulation that doesn't actually solve the underlying problem. And I fear that if you apply this to banks of $100 billion and above, you actually are doing just that. So uh, with that in mind, I'll, uh, I'll yield. Thanks, Mr. Chair. Thanks, Senator Vance. Senator Tester of Montana is recognized. Yeah, thank you, Chairman Brown, and, and thank you for being here, uh, Chair Powell. We appreciate your work uh, in a difficult situation, but I think you've done a really good job, and so thank you for that. Um, look, at success at the Fed on your mandate for strong employment and stable prices is critical for small businesses on Main Street, for farmers, for ranchers, for Montana families. Uh, you follow all the metrics. From your perspective, where is the economy at now, and where is it going? You know, the economy is growing at a, at a, a healthy, uh, sustainable, solid, strong pace. And that's that's one thing. Second thing I'd say is the labor market is yeah. very strong and, and quite tight still. 3.7% 3 unemployment for the last 24 months. That's the longest period since, you know, 50 years. Um, and the third thing is inflation. Inflation was too high. It's come down very sharply since the beginning of last year. If you look at the 12-month number, the headline number has come down from the fives down to 2.4. And the, uh, the uh, core number is at 2.8. I think it was at 4.9 a year ago. So these are big declines. So we're, we're in a very different place, in a healthy place. We're going to use our tools to try to keep that strong economy, keep that strong labor market, while we continue to make progress on inflation. One of the areas where there has been um, inflation, and I don't exactly know where it's at now, but food rose quite rapidly. And by the way, I'm a farmer. We didn't get much of that. In fact, we didn't get any of it. <clears throat> Prices now compared to what they were uh, a year ago are actually off. Uh, compared to whether six years ago, they're up. But compared to whether a year ago, they're down. And so my question to you, Chairman Powell, is there anything you can do specifically to deal with food costs? So as you, I'm, I'm telling a farmer his business, but um, if you look at the food cost to the consumer, part of that is commodity costs, and that was partly spiked uh, as you know because of Ukraine, grains and oil and that kind of thing. But the rest of it is a lot of costs in the in the supply chain from when it leaves the farm to get you know uh, collected and and processed and trucked around and then put on the shelves and and then the stores, you know, and the, all of those costs are just part of the general economy. So. As the labor market cools off from its overheated status two years ago, you will see, and you have seen, you know, food inflation flattening out. And so, that, you know, the, the really high rates of inflation have come down. The yeah. prices, of course, have not. Uh, correct. I, 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 would, I would just say that uh, cattle's doing uh, better. Grain actually has dropped in price at the farm gate, and I don't want to get into that debate with you at all because... Um, we probably agree, but it'd take too long, take too much time. We've got other stuff to talk about. I'd be learning from you. Um, you you've discussed in, in previous hearings the impacts that the pandemic uh, shutdowns and supply chain issues have had uh, on economies globally. Um, how does the U.S. economy look today compared to our competitor nations, particularly China? Well, I, 
I start with the advanced economies. Uh, you know, we're doing the best of anybody. We, we've got the strongest growth and the lowest inflation of, of the advanced economies. China is a whole different story. China is having, you know, significant difficulties uh, with its economy right now. And they're in a very different place than, than certainly than we are. Um, and so to, to repeat that, what I heard you say is that the economy of the United States is basically in better shape than any other economy in the world? Any other major economy, yes. Yes, okay. Look, uh, one of the other challenges out there is housing um, in communities all across this country, whether you're in Montana, whether you're in a city in Ohio, um, how, workforce housing in particular is a top, uh, a top priority, top commodity, so to speak. Um, plenty of folks, great organizations are working to address this. I meet them every day and I appreciate the work they're doing. Uh, but how do these housing supplies issues show up in the data that the FOMC uses to make decisions? So housing, housing prices um, don't go into the data. Housing starts and ha renovations and things like that are just business activity and that, that shows up. Um, but, but when it comes to inflation, we're, we, you know, we convert ownership into an imputed rent, and then we look at rents, okay. and so we look at that's how we look at all that. So we're not we're not directly affected by by changes in housing prices, but over time those will those will drive rents up. So, so is it fair to ask? Are there economic trends that you see for housing? Yes. So I, I, there's two big things going on. One is we have this underlying shortage of housing, and it's due to things like you know difficulties of zoning. A lot of the close in to cities places that were already built, and so dif more difficult to get zoning, more difficult to get people and materials and all that. That's one thing, and that's not going away. Then there's just a ton of things happening because of the pandemic, because of inflation, because of higher rates. And those are, in, short, in the short term, those have really, they're weighing on the housing uh, market. But as rates come down, and that all goes through the economy, we're still going to be back to a, a, a place where we don't have enough housing. Once again, th thank you, Chairman Powell, for your work. I, I very much appreciate it. Thank you, Chairman Thanks. Brown. Thanks, Senator Chester, Senator Kramer of North Dakota. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Chairman Paul, good to see you. Thank you for being here. It's been a rather uneventful couple of days for you, considering <laughs> you've spent two days in this place. Um, and I don't, I'm not going to upset that, by the way, just so you know. But I, I did appreciate um, your your response earlier to Senator Scott when he asked about immigration and he said, you, you know, the Fed hasn't been assigned that. Um, so I want to bring up something else you haven't been assigned to that you and I have talked about over the years, and that, of course, is climate, the role of climate uh, in, in your job, the role of climate risk in banking. And you've often said, I think, you, I think the most common statement was, we should stick to our knitting, I think is one of yours, uh, stay in our lane, um, similar to what you said probably to, to Senator Scott. But that said, in October, the Fed, the OCC, the FDIC uh, issued climate guidance, as you know, um, for management of covered institutions. And so I'm just kind of curious, <clears throat> did Congress somewhere along the line give the Fed authority over climate policy as well? Or was that another, is that another one of those things that somebody just took on? And I've realized you're not the dictator of the Fed, only the chairman of the Fed. Um, but I'd be interested in, as the chairman, your views on it. Our, um, no, our assignment is, is the safety and soundness of banks and that they understand and can manage the risks that they face. That's our assignment. And we said in, in, in climate world, we would do two and only two things. One of them was to uh, do a, uh, il illustrative uh, stress scenarios, mm -hmm. scenarios, not stress scenarios, scenarios, climate scenarios, so that, you know, the banks are already doing this. The large banks who are subject to right. this, they're already doing it because they ha they're doing business internationally and they don't mm -hmm. have any choice. So we said we'd do that. And we also said that we'd offer guidance on, not, not on the level of climate risk or anything like that, just on what you had to do to be in a position to assess. And, and that's, if, for my thinking, that's it. That's what we're doing. And um, we're not doing it. There are no new initiatives. We're not gonna change our capital requirements to reflect uh, climate risk or anything like that. I'm I'm really determined that we are not a climate policy maker and that that is really the business of elected officials. Very good. Thank you. Um, I'm going to bring up one other topic. I don't know that's been brought up today, and that, that's central bank digital currency. I think f from a lot of my friends out there, I think there's some, well, I know there's some confusion. I mean, I, I'm easy to confuse, but there are a lot of people that get confused about what is meant by the administration's, you know, admonition to, to continue researching, experimenting, looking at some sort of a, you know, 
uh, central bank digital currency, people, I think people back home look at that and go, oh my gosh, you know, they're going to control this now. Um, and could you maybe just differentiate a little bit what people think of in terms of a, a Bitcoin or, or their held digital currencies versus what a central bank digital currency, who, in my view, should emulate cash, right? It's, it still should be about the dollar, not about some different kind of currency. Could you just sort of help people back home better understand why they shouldn't try. be quite so frightened? For, first of all, I want to say that we're, we're nowhere near recommending or let alone uh, in adopting a central bank digital currency in any form. But the idea is that as technology has evolved, money has become digital. So, um, but the government doesn't issue digital money. It's digital. If you look at your bank account, people don't hold those physical dollars. They're digital. So the thought was that the government could create a digital form of money that people could then transfer among themselves. Now, of course, that raises a concern that, that if, you, if that were a government account, that the government would see all your transactions. And that's just something we would not, we would not stand for or do or propose here in the United States. That is how, uh, how it works in China, for example. But that's not what we're, we're so if we were to ever to do something like this, and we're a very long way from even thinking about it, we would do this through the banking system. The last thing we would want, we, the Federal Reserve would want, would be to have individual accounts for all Americans or any Americans for that matter. Only banks have accounts at the Fed, mm -hmm. and that's the way we're going to keep it. So it's, it's just really, it's a question of, of following technology as it evolves and in a way that serves the public better. Uh, people don't need to worry about a central bank digital currency. Nothing like that is, is remotely close to happening anytime soon. That was very helpful. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Chairman. Senator, Kramer, Senator Cortez Masto of Nevada is recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, Chairman Powell, great to see you again. Thank you for all of your good work. I, I want to talk a little bit about um, the commercial real estate and what's happening there. Um, the Financial Stability Oversight Council's 2023 annual report identified commercial real estate as a financial risk. And the Fed's monetary report also noted commercial real estate prices continue to decline, especially in the office, retail, and multifamily <clears throat> sectors. I'm especially concerned that because of the low levels of transactions in, in the office uh, sector, prices have not yet fully reflected the true decline in the value. So can you expand on the emerging risk the Federal Reserve has identified in the, in the commercial real estate market, one? And then I'm curious, can you discuss the, the compound risks identified in commercial real estate lending particularly um, at banks with large CRE concentrations and high fractions of, of uninsured deposits? Sure. Um, let me see. I think um, there are just very, very few transactions in, in commercial real estate right now, particularly in the troubled areas. So it's not a question of prices still falling. It's a question that you don't have the kind of price discovery. We, you just have to assume that the prices are, are very low and have come down a lot. Um, so on, on commercial real estate, uh, y y we have a secular change in uh, people working from home. This is one big part of it. That means that in many cities, the downtown office district is very underpopulated. There are empty buildings in, in many major and minor cities. It also means that all the, all the you know, retail that was there to service the thousands and thousands of people who work in those buildings, they're under pressure too. And banks will have made loans to many of those buildings. Not all of them, but many. So this, this we've known for, for some years. And so what do we do? We have identified the banks that have high commercial real estate uh, concentrations, particularly office and retail, and other ones that, are, that have been affected a lot. We identify them, and we are in dialogue with them around, you know, do, do you have your arms around this problem? Do you have enough capital? Uh, do you have enough liquidity? Do you have a plan? You're going to take losses here. Are you, are you being truthful with yourself and with your owners? And so we've been working with them. And so for some time, we've been doing that. And I, you know, this is a problem that we'll be working on for years more, I'm sure. There will be bank failures, but this is not the big banks. If you look at the very big banks, it's not a first order issue for any of the, of the very large banks. It's more you know, smaller and medium sized banks that have these issues. We're working with them. We're getting through it. I, um, my, my, I, I think it's manageable is the word I would use, but it, it's, you know, it's a very active thing for us and the other regulators, and it will be for some time. Thank you. <clears throat> Do you have concerns? Uh, well, uh, let me just ask you this. As you're talking with these 
small and medium sized banks? Because we know there's always could be a contagion, which we've seen in the past. Do you have concerns <clears throat> that if they fail, that somehow this is going to impact uh, the, the financial sector? And are you prepared and trying to address that and prevent that from happening? We're trying to stay ahead of that. So we also reached out to banks that had high concentrations of uninsured deposits, uh, and particularly uninsured deposits, and uh, a lot of commercial real estate in the office sector. So we're, you know, we're, we're well aware of that issue, and we're just trying to stay ahead of it on a bank-by-bank -bank basis and, and overall. Okay. And so far, we've been able to do that. Thank you. Uh, let, let me jump to uh, another issue that uh, has been on my radar. Um, the Federal Housing Finance Agency's report on the federal home loan banks uh, included or concluded that the distinction between the FH, F, FHL bank's role and that of the Federal Reserve discount window as lender of last resort has not been clear, especially during times of market stress. During the 2023 banking turmoil, we saw banks rely on advances from the federal home loan loan banks and didn't even have relationships with the Federal Reserve um, to use its discount window. I know you've talked a little bit about this with um, Senator Warner, but how is the Federal Reserve working with the federal home loan banks to ensure that banks establish protocols to borrow from the Fed's discount window prior to times of stress? We, we work with the federal home loan banks because in many cases, uh, banks were moving their loan from the federal <laughs> home loan bank to the Fed. So we need to have smooth transfer. We need to be in good touch with them. Even more important than that, though, is that banks, any bank in the United States, uh, needs to be in touch with the discount window, know, know how to be able to, to access it, be able to access it, have appropriate collateral, have control of that collateral. You know, in many cases, it was just was incredibly inefficient and took a long time for banks to actually go through that function. The, home, the federal home loan banks are actually ahead of us in technology. We, we know that we need to really invest in technology to modernize the discount window, and also we need to do more to make the, to, to get our, our banks, all of them, in touch with the, with the discount window in a way that they can use it quickly should they need to do so. Thank you. <clears throat> Cortez Master, Senator Haggerty of uh, Tennessee is recognized. Thank you, Chairman Brown. Welcome, Chairman Powell. Um, under, the, under your tenure, Mr. Chairman, the Fed has taken the stance that the 2% inflation target shouldn't be viewed as a snapshot in time, but rather it needs to be achieved, quote, sustainably. When inflation was running well above the 2% target back in 2021 and early 2022, the Fed was patient and allowed rates to offset the below target inflation that had occurred in the years prior. It strikes me as odd now that while we're still well above target inflation and have been well above for the prior year, markets seem to expect the Fed to immediately cut even before we've breached the 2% inflation threshold. So my question is, is this, if the inflation rate reaches 2%, would that be considered a return to the target rate on a sustainable basis? Or is it still the case that inflation would need to more or less overcorrect to well below 2% before the Fed makes the rate cut adjustments? We, um, it would take us a while to really get comfortable that inflation had set, settled in sustainably at 2%. But that's not our test for, for uh, changing interest rates. Interest rates right now are well under restrictive territory. They're well above neutral. And we've said we would not wait for inflation to get down to 2% because if you wait that, you know, monetary policy works with long and variable lags. So we've said, you know, for some years that, uh, that we would start restoring uh, the, the federal funds rate to a more normal, almost neutral level. We're far from neutral now. Yeah. And so, you know, we do plan, um, assuming the economy moves along the lines we expect, we do plan on on starting the process of dialing back restrictions. I'm, I'm just trying to square look for the symmetry. I, I know we sort of allowed the economy to overshoot uh, when inflation was high. And, and we sort of made up for prior years of low inflation. I'm trying to square that with the fact that we, we didn't actually do that. We, we adopted a framework that said we would do that, but then we got suddenly, a few months later, we got an, a, almost an explosion of very high inflation. That's not what we were looking. We, no. we said you know moder moderately above or modestly above 2%. This was not modestly above 2%. And we reacted. We, we thought that the, the mistake we made was we thought that that, that, that inflation would go away uh, that it was quickly, transitory, when transitory it which means not. it goes away quickly without effort by us. We figured out at the end of 21 that that was not the case, and we acted 
and you don't see see that same abrupt dynamic coming the other way. You're more comfortable. No, with I think I, I look. I think we're in the right place, which is we're waiting to see. We're waiting to become more confident that inflation is moving sustainably at two percent. Mm -hmm. When we do get that confidence, and we're not far from it, it'll be appropriate to begin to dial back the level of restriction so that we don't, you know, drive the economy into recession rather than normalizing policy as the economy gets back to normal. Yeah. Can we go to the balance sheet um, and talk about that? Um, we've seen a dramatic expansion of the Fed's balance sheet over the past couple of decades. In 2005, it was at $800 billion. It's at $7.5 today. <laughs> it's doubled since the pandemic uh, was underway. And through quantitative tapering, the Fed is attempting to, to reduce its footprint. And the concern I have is, on the other hand, government spending tends to just continue to be profligate. We're running now a trillion dollar deficit every 100 days, and we're flooding the market with treasury debt, and we're push, putting upward pressure on interest rates as a result. And what I think that is lost on, on many of us here is that the spending levels will only make your job harder when it comes to lowering interest rates, not to mention there's a tacit expectation that the Fed will step in once the markets can no longer absorb our new issuance. Uh, I think this is a very serious problem. I think it deserves more attention. And I think we're now at a point where your objectives may be you know, very much uh, at odds with the behavior of our physical policy. And, and, am I missing something here, Mr. Chairman, or does increased net issuance by the Treasury lead to higher rates? I mean, in principle, more supply should lead to modestly higher rates, but that's not going to affect what we do. Um, that's not a problem for us. We're, you know, our, our balance sheet normalization is running very much as expected. We've de decreased the size of our holdings by almost one and a half trillion dollars. I, I hear you. I just, I, I think it's troubling that we continue to put physical pressure by continuing to put, again, we're, we're running a deficit of a trillion dollars every 100 days, and the issuance is required to deal with that. We're putting a lot more pressure, I think, on the Fed, and again, making your job harder. I think we need to take that into consideration. A, a, another component of this topic, uh, your colleague Governor Waller said <clears throat> he'd like the Fed to shift its holdings toward a larger share of short-term treasuries. Back prior to the financial crisis, about a third of the Fed's holdings were in bills. Now they're around 3% of your total securities holdings. Do, do you share the goal with, with Governor Waller? And if so, how long will it take us to, to get there? Take a while. You know, that's, that's an issue. We're in our FOMC meeting in a couple of weeks. Uh, we're going to have our first really deep dive on what to do with the balance sheet. That's one of the issues. I don't think we'll deal with that at this meeting. But over time, um, you know, you'd love not to own a lot of MBS. And, and, and I can see a case for shortening uh, the maturity. But it's not something, you know, it's not something that would happen quickly. And, it's, and you know, we're, we're, not, we're not actively looking at that. That's sort of a longer term aspiration that I think he was just, saying. Just one final point, Mr. Chair. And you and I have talked about this before. Mm -hmm. we're, we're, we're in an election year. You're getting a lot of pressure. I hear it from lawmakers to uh, adjust rates. I'm not telling you to raise rates or lower rates, but I'm just here to emphasize the fact that the credibility of the Fed depends on your remaining data driven. The credibility of our currency as the, as the reserve currency of the world depends on that, and I encourage you to continue to maintain that posture. Thank you. Will do. Thank Thanks, you. Senator Haggard. Senator Warren of Massachusetts is right. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. So it's been a year since we had the second, third, and fourth largest bank failures in American history. Greedy bank executives were part of the problem. The Fed, as the chief regulator of the biggest banks, was part of the problem. Under your leadership and direction, the Fed steadily weakened rules for the biggest billionaire banks, exactly the banks that failed last March. In other words, Chair Powell, you failed to do your job to keep these big banks in line. Now, when these banks blew up, you went into spin mode, promising that the Fed would do better. After years of hemming and hawing, you finally agreed to put in place Basel III rules that would strengthen capital standards for the biggest banks. And I mean the biggest banks. These are the Fed's proposed rule would apply to only 37 of the nation's 4,500 banks, only the banks that have $100 billion or more in capital. Now, Chair Powell, when you testified before this committee last June, I asked you about taking responsibility for bank failures. And you said, quote, the main responsibility I take is to learn the right lessons <clears throat> from this and to undertake to address them so we don't have a situation like this where we had unexpectedly a large bank fail and spread contagion into the banking system, end quote. And as part of learning those lessons, 
you also said, quote, that you agree with and support, end quote, Vice Chair for Supervision Barr's recommendations for <clears throat> strengthening the Fed's rules and supervisory practices for the big banks, and that you're, quote, confident they will lead to a stronger and more resilient banking system, end quote. So I just want to be clear. You haven't backed down from any of your comments from a year ago, have you, Chair Powell? Write lessons, don't let this happen again, supporting Vice Chair Barr's recommendations, which include stronger capital standards. No. Still stand by all that? Yes. Good, good. I'm glad to hear that. Now, I understand that those 37 big banks don't like higher capital rules because they are like insurance. You know, it, they would make the banks safer, but they cost a little money and would nip into the bank's profits. So these 37 banks are swinging their very considerable weight around to try to weaken the capital rules. They've spent tens of millions of dollars running ads during Sunday night football and millions more for an army of lobbyists to try to twist arms here in Congress. Impressive spending, but who exactly are they trying to impress? <clears throat> A man on the inside? You know, despite all you said last year when the banks failed about supporting Vice Chair Barr's recommendations to strengthen rules for big banks, public reporting now says that you are driving efforts inside the Fed to weaken the capital rule. You even told the House Financial Services Committee representatives yesterday that you think it's, quote, very plausible, close quote, that you withdraw the rule. As one analyst put it, quote, I don't think they will pass a final rule without Powell's support, suggesting that the rules will have to be weakened, quote, to appease Powell. So Chair Powell, I'm having trouble reconciling the statements you made last year, which you say you hold on to, statements you made when the headlines were all about three giant bank failures, and now your reported efforts to quietly weaken the rules that would strengthen capital standards for giant banks and prevent more bank failures. So let me just give you a chance to clarify the record here. Are you committed to finalizing the strongest version of the Basel III capital rules this year? Let me first say that um, we have taken and are taking many more steps to deal with the problems that, that uh, revealed themselves with Silicon Valley Bank, and that's around supervision, I'll we'll have a strong liquidity. I appreciate that, but I'm just asking about the Basel III rules, the ones that you have been yeah, I, required for years now to put in place Basel, and have dragged your feet on. The Basel III rules are, are not directly related. They're not the thing that is directly related to Silicon Valley Bank. As you point out, they're, they're a longer run uh, thing, and I, I would just say that um, we put them out for comment. We got the comments. Uh, anybody's free to go read the comments. My my view is that it will be appropriate to make material and broad changes to that before we finalize it. And in terms of, I, I didn't Ma say that- Material and broad changes to strengthen the rules? Material and broad changes, and you know, we're talking about what that'll mean in the end. I did not say that we would withdraw the rule. I said, you know, there's, there's a concept of reproposal, and I said we hadn't made a decision on that, but that if that turns out to be appropriate in the view of the Board of Governors, then that's something we would look at doing. So everything you said a year ago about supporting the vice chair who is responsible for writing these rules? You and I had a long college. Yes, we did. If you read it again, it's on your website. And I have. You will see that I'm doing exactly what I said I would do in no, that college. No, you said you would support vice chair Barr to get us strong rules. And now he is putting no, out rules that and was you're about talking Silicon about Valley Bank. The, the, the vice chair for supervision has every right to, to bring proposals to the board. That has happened. But as I made clear in our colloquy, um, the, it's, you're not the comptroller of the currency. This is a, it's, when, I, when I do monetary policy, I have one vote. There, yeah. there are 11 other voters. And that's the way it works. It's not different for the vice chair for supervision. You are the leader of the Fed. And when the heat was on last year, you talked a lot about getting tougher on the banks, but now the giant banks are unhappy about that, and you've gone weak need on this. The American people need a leader at the Fed who has the courage to stand up to these banks and protect our financial system. Thank you, Mr. Chairman.
Warren. Uh, Senator uh, Daines of Montana is recognized. Chairman, thank you. Uh, Chairman Powell, uh, thanks for being here. Good to see you. Uh, I can tell you Montanans are continuing to see the impacts across the board from inflation that's been brought on by the policies of this administration and by my colleagues across the aisle. And I commend you for the job you have done in trying to rein in inflation and I encourage you to continue the fight despite political pressures you may face. I, last time I checked, it's gonna get a little more political around here between now and November. I'm also encouraged, contrary perhaps to my colleague from Massachusetts, I'm encouraged by your comments yesterday that there will be broad changes to the Basel III proposal, which, as it's currently proposed, would have significant detrimental impacts to credit cost and availability to small businesses. And lastly, I commend your answer yesterday that the Fed is not a climate agency and considering the impact of climate change is not a factor in achieving your given mandate, congressional mandate of maximum employment and stable prices. Mr. Chairman, I recently joined many of my colleagues in writing to you about my concerns about the long-term debt proposal that would mandate regional banks issue new long-term debt. I'm concerned that this will have a disproportionate impact on smaller regional banks because they're required to hold their long-term debt at both the parent holding company and insured depository bank levels. Could you explain how this aligns with the tailoring requirements set forth in the financial reform bill that we passed back in 2018, Senate Bill 2155? So how the longer-term debt proposal aligns with that? Mm -hmm. So first of all, we have, we, that's been out for comment uh, on that one. The comments are in, we're reviewing it. So uh, I don't want to say too much, but the, the theory of it in the, in the first place was that they're not, those banks are not subject to the, 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 the living will process to the extent that the GSIBs are. And this was sort of meant to be a middle step to make them more resolvable without without imposing all of the burdens that we impose on, on the eight GSIBs to have very elaborate uh, uh, resolution plans. So that was the, that was the thinking, I think, on, on the uh, calibration of it and all that. We, we have voluminous comments. We're looking at them, and you know, we'll make an assessment and, and move forward as appropriate. Well, thank you. And I know our, our, our smaller <clears throat> regional kind of banks would be happy to hear that, that thoughtful deliberation, Mr. Chairman. Um, understandably, you've had to raise interest rates to fight the fires of inflation brought on by reckless Democrat spending. However, a major side effect of that is the impact the rising rates are having on the cost of servicing the out-of-control national debt. Senator Haggerty alluded to this a bit in his questioning minutes ago. Looking at CBO reports, interest payments on our debt will increase 32% this year and will now exceed spending for the entire Defense Department. I have significant concerns, many do here in Washington, many Americans do, that we eventually reach a point where fiscal policy and monetary policy converge, meaning that the Fed would ultimately have to worry about the impact rate setting would have on government debt or even potentially the risk of a default. Chairman Powell, I know fiscal policy is not in your purview, but could you ever foresee a situation where fiscal irresponsibility snowballs to a point that the Fed would have to factor this into its decision making? You know, I think we're a long way from that. And, and you know, that's a real, uh, that, that's a terrible place to be. That's, that's a place where some poor emerging market countries have found themselves over the years for the United States to get that point. I think it's unlikely, but I, I do think that and it's not our business we should stay out of this fiscal business but i'll say what other fed chairs have said which is we it, we really need to get back to that discussion about fiscal sustainability and it's and both sides need to get together the kinds of things that have to happen can only be done on a bipartisan basis and and so i i, I really hope that we go back to a place where those discussions are, are happening again I've heard from a number of um, stakeholders about upcoming changes to liquidity regs, including an, a new ultra short-term liquidity requirement. 
As with any policy decision, establishing the facts matters. It's important that financial regulators have a complete, thorough understanding of the financial environment before releasing a half-baked proposal rule or guidance. My question is, what do you believe is a sufficient time period that would allow your agency to accurately calibrate new sound and reasonable liquidity requirements? That is a great question and one we're struggling with, uh, particularly with all the other things that are going on. We, you know, we're looking at some, and this is in response to Silicon Valley Bank, we're looking at some liquidity innovations and we're asking ourselves, what, which form should that take and how long should it be up for comment and that sort of thing. We're not, we're not ready to do that yet, but that's, that's the question we're asking. Follow on question and I'm finished, Mr. Chairman. Um, will you confirm that prior to the Federal Reserve issuing any new liquidity requirements, it will first conduct all necessary data collection that would allow for meaningful analysis of all potential policy options. And please keep your answer short, Mr. Chairman. Maybe. <laughs> no, That's very short. Thank you. I, I can't, we can talk about this more, but uh, I don't want to make a really specific commitment like that without talking to the people who are, you know, carefully in touch with this. But that, that is the right thought. Thanks, Chairman. Uh, thank you, Senator uh, Fetterman uh, from Pennsylvania is recognized. Well, he got, he got here last. Nope. So, um, if Although if Senator Warnock I, sits down in the next five seconds, he's next. So, Senator Warnock, are you ready or you want to go to War 5? You're all so generous with each other. It's, <laughs> Senator Fetterman's recognized. All right. Okay. All right. Senator Warnock is recognized from Georgia. Thank you, Chairman. Thanks. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Thanks spending on buybacks is rising again. And their consumer small has sharply increased. Interest rates are high, yet the interest being paid to depositors, ordinary working families, working people uh, with bank accounts. Not a lot of money in Wall Street accounts remains low. Um, Chairman Powell, I'm concerned that when banks don't increase the interest rates on bank accounts, uh, families are losing out on dollars that could be in their pockets. Again, they don't have the kinds of portfolios that some of the folks in this room would have. Is that good for the economy? And are you concerned that banks under your supervision are doing this? Are, are not paying sufficient. Uh, Th that's correct. That's, that's a question I haven't... Uh... I haven't heard. Of course, they have the option of putting their money in money market funds, but and banks compete with each other. Uh, but I'll be happy to look into that. I hadn't uh, hadn't heard that concern. Yeah, you know, and I, I think it, it is worth taking a look at. Uh, many lower income individuals and families, uh, again, they don't have some of the sophisticated products yet. Money markets are available, but we we saw high interest rates and and that not being reflected in in what depositors are able to, to uh, uh, benefit from. Um, could those individuals and families benefit from a high interest rate on their deposits? Sure. Um, and you know, it's for a long time, uh, we, we had a lot of mail from people at the Fed, uh, to the Fed saying, you know, you should raise interest rates because we're not getting anything on our, on our checking accounts. So we yeah, solved that problem. I, I, don't, I don't think we're asking for that, <laughs> but, but given the reality, the, the question, yeah. So let, let me, let me uh, pivot. The monetary policy <clears throat> report states that while uh, demand for housing has fallen, the strong labor market has kept prices high. Uh, that matches what I've been seeing in Georgia. Uh, too many folks can't afford a home. According to the monetary policy report, mortgage rates were averaging around 7% last month. Uh, that's tough for lower income home buyers, increases of just a percentage point or two can be the difference between owning a home or not. Are you concerned about this interplay between lower demand, yet stubbornly high prices, and what it means for folks trying to buy a home? And what do you think is, is driving these high prices? So that the housing market is um, in a very challenging situation right now. You have this longer run housing shortage 
But at the same time, you've got a bunch of things that have to do with the pandemic and the inflation and our response with higher rates. So you, ha you have a shortage of homes available for sale because many people are living in homes with a very low rate mortgage that they can't afford to refinance, so they're not moving, which means the supply of regular existing homes that are for sale is historically low and very low transaction rate. That actually pushes up prices of, of, of other existing homes and also of new homes because there's just not enough supply. The builders are busy, but they're running into you know, all kinds of supply issues still around zoning and, and uh, workers and things like that. So, so the, it's, it's quite challenging. And of course, rates are high. So people who are buying, a lot of the buyers are, are cash buyers or, or are able to actually pay without a mortgage because mortgages are expensive. I will say the first problem, the longer run problem of supply is a longer run problem. The other problems associated with low rate mortgages and high rates and all that, those will abate as the economy normalizes and as rates normalize. Uh, but we'll still be left with with a housing market nationally where where there's a housing shortage. There's no question we have a supply issue, and um, <clears throat> this issue of of high prices, lack of supply, of course, disproportionately impacts some communities more than others. According to the Monetary Policy Report, the employment rate for the black uh, prime age labor force, that is, persons between 25 and 54 years of age reached a historical peak in 2023. The gap between black and white prime age employment uh, dropped to a nearly 50 year low at around 3%. We can appreciate progress, but a 3% gap is still significant. Would you agree that it is important to continue, to continue focusing on narrowing this gap? And if so, what tools does the Federal Reserve have to do this work? It's very important and the single best thing we can do is get prices under control, get inflation under control, <clears throat> so that we can have a long expansion with, uh, the, the, the record is clear that a long expansion really gives significant benefits to people at the, at the low end of the income spectrum because the labor market gets very tight, inflation is low, and they benefit more than anybody. So that's where we were before the pandemic, and we'd like to get back to that place. Thank you so very much. I think there are some other legislative tools that Congress could use. And, and um, I'm happy to continue to work with the chair uh, in the ways that we've already done uh, to, to improve that rate, that difference. Thank you. For sure. Thank you, Senator Warnock. Uh, Senator Lamas from Wyoming is recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, welcome. Uh, it's nice to see you, Mr. Powell. Um, my first question is about uh, uh, CDBCs. There's been some chatter lately on the uh, social media. Uh, that people are concerned about uh, the Fed creating a CDBC without uh, legislative authorization. You and I have discussed that before, um, and as you know, there, there are other means other than a CDBC that uh, could use digital assets to create a secure and instant payment system other than a CDBC. Um, so the question is this, do you still agree that the Federal Reserve cannot introduce a U.S. central bank digital currency without congressional authorization? Yes, I do. Thank you. That's just, that really calms people's fears, the people who are concerned that we could end up with something like the digital yuan that is used as a means of surveillance. So I think that that will calm some of those discussions down. Thank you so much. My next question is about your core CPE. <clears throat> now, as you know, there's a disconnect between how you measure inflation and how the American people see inflation because the American people are spending their money on gasoline and food and rent things that <clears throat> have gone up a lot. Uh, and uh, they hear about these improvements in the economy um, that they're not seeing in their everyday lives. So can you explain um, what measures you use to evaluate inflation and just explain to the American people why you don't factor in the things they spend money on every day like food and gasoline? Actually, we do. <clears throat> Our statutory target is inflation. It's not core inflation. So and if you look at, if you look at uh, headline inflation over the last 12 months, that's it. That's, the, that's our goal. 
it's 2.4%. Core inflation is actually higher than that. It's 2.8%. And the reason is that some energy and food prices have come down, and those don't count in core. So we, you know, our overall legal target is, is headline inflation, which is, you know, it's our best effort to capture the, the, the cost of living that people face. It's not perfect. It's very, you have to make all kinds of judgments that aren't easy. I mentioned that the housing earlier. How do you measure housing inflation? Lots of issues, but that's what we target. The reason we look at core, though, is that uh, headline inflation uh, tends to be more volatile and it tends to be pushed around by commodity prices, which really don't relate to um, the overall state of the economy. Is it tight? Is it loose? So core tends to be a better predictor of overall inflation than overall inflation is. I know that's complicated, but ultimately, though, our target is headline inflation, which does include food and energy. I, Mr. Chairman, I'd like to <clears throat> include a letter in the record that uh, Senator Tillis and I and two Democrats on this committee um, have uh, submitted with regard to Basel III. My question- Wait, without uh, objection. Thank you very much. Uh, my question is this. What do you think is more likely that it will be harder for consumers to buy a house and small business to obtain a loan? under Basel III, or will lending just migrate outside the banking system, which may be harder to assess because it's opaque? I'm sorry, I didn't get your question. I apologize. Okay. So with regard to Basel III, yeah. um, if um, there are more constraints on um, lending activity, what is more apt to be the consequence of that? Mm that it's harder for consumers to buy a house or a small business to get a loan, or that lending just migrates outside of the traditional banking system? So if, if there were anything that, were, that, that constricted credit in the banking system, they would probably, probably be both things. Probably there'd be fewer loans made, but in addition, there would be non-bank lenders that are more than happy to make that loan. Mm -hmm. I, I, was, uh, I have a chicken and the egg question here. Um, starting with TARP in 2008, uh, there has been a very aggressive printing of U.S. dollars uh, up until today, and it particularly uh, went on hyperdrive during that 22-month period of COVID. So my question is, which comes first, Congress spending more and so you respond by printing more money? Or are they separate considerations? I, <laughs> I think it's hard to get my mind around that question. Um, we don't print money to fund the deficit. That's not what happens. Um, when, but when the government borrows, it borrows. It issues, it, it, basically, the government borrows to fund deficits is what happens. Right. And so that's so so that would indicate to me that you do respond because we in spending in deficit spending are creating a demand to borrow, and you're responding by. Well, we're not making loans though. You know, we're not we're not we're not lending money to the government. We're not financing these deficits. And so there's no chicken in the egg relationship. There's there's not really no. Um, I'd have to think about this. This is a, I got to think about the way the plumbing. Why don't we continue this? Yeah, I'd love to. And your uh, thoughts earlier about fiscal sustainability and how we can work with you um, and bipartisan, maybe next year, um, to address these issues. You know, when you say things, it's you, you have to be careful because what you say has sense of ripple effects outside of this building, but it would sure be nice if we could sit down with you on a bipartisan basis and have those discussions in a, in a frank way. Thank uh, you, Senator Lemus. Senator Fetterman of Pennsylvania is recognized. All right, Sen Senator Van Hollen of Maryland is recognized. Uh, let, me, um, no, let me start by thanking Senator Fetterman uh, for his allowing me to, to question him. Mr. Chairman, good to see you. Um, uh, real wages are up, right? That's good news. Okay. Yes, over the last couple of years, um, 
you know, wages have been going up more than inflation, real wages broadly are up. That means more families have more spending power in their budgets, right? Yes. Uh, worker productivity is up, right? Yes, it is. Uh, corporate profits are up, right? I believe so. And productivity, worker productivity is rising faster than corporate profits, right? I don't know the answer to that. That may well be right. I, the, the charts I, I show suggest that. So that would indicate that uh, unless you know, corporations decide to pocket as profits more of the gains they get from their workers' labor, that we should be able to continue to have increases in real wages. Is that right? Yeah. And so I just, it's important, I think, that you know, people <clears throat> recognize that <clears throat> these corporations are doing better than ever. And they are deciding now to essentially return the gains made through their workers' productivity, which is going up, um, more to shareholders. Obviously, shareholders we're going to get a profit, but the question is whether or not um, workers uh, share in that profit to the extent of their worker productivity. And as you know, we've seen a great gap over decades uh, between rising worker productivity and, and real wages, and uh, we're hoping to close that uh, gap. Would you agree that uh, it would be good for a more inclusive economy if, if worker wages tracked worker productivity increases? I think, I think if you include benefits, it, it, that's, that's a significant part of that gap. I've looked into that, but not for, not for some years. But I mean, generally speaking, people's compensation should, equal, should be over time equal to increases in productivity. I appreciate that. Uh, and I, I also want to, there's the trade-off on workers' wages, and there's also <clears throat> uh, an issue with price gouging, right? So we have seen record profits. Um, We've also seen very high uh, prices these corporations are charging uh, for things like groceries. Now, I, I listened to a little bit of exchange with the chairman uh, earlier, and of course, um, I think your answer was, you know, people will charge what consumers will pay. But it should be known that these corporations are reaping much larger profits now than they were pre-COVID, for example, right? I mean, I, 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 some of them are. I'm not, I'm not super focused on individual corporate profits, but um, yeah, corporate profits, I gather, have been high overall. Right. I mean, they're, they're high for a couple reasons. One is that they're charging consumers, for example, at the grocery stores, a lot of money. Uh, and the other would be if they're not sharing the benefits of labor productivity uh, with their employees. Uh, so I, I think because we've heard a lot of claims by some of our Republican colleagues uh, about the causes of price uh, increases, and I think it's very important that American consumers recognize uh, that corporations are choosing to charge them more uh, at the grocery store or engaging in things like shrinkflation, uh, rather uh, than um, in, in order to, to have more of their profits. Let me, um, let me turn briefly to uh, a letter that I sent um, to uh, the Vice Chair of Supervision and some of the other federal regulators um, in January of this year uh, regarding the, the Basel III capital requirements. And um, I support the overall effort uh, on on Basel. We did raise concerns with respect to a specific issue, which is the harmful and we think unnecessarily uh, harmful impact it could have on clean energy uh, tax credit uh, investments. And all of the regulators testifying that day, including the vice chairman, said they recognized this was a significant issue uh, and hope to address it. Would you agree with that? Yes, I would. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Senator Fetterman. Uh, thanks, Chairman Holland. Senator Fetterman of Pennsylvania is recognized. Yes, I, I love that. All right. <laughs> so it's great to be here with you today. Now, I don't know, maybe some people in America were talking about uh, a cookie that was $18. And I was, I was alarmed, and I hope we investigate a, that there is a, an eight, uh, a cookie that cost $18. And, 
And uh, do you believe that an anecdote on Twitter about a cookie that cut $18, is that reflective of our economy and where we're at or not? I certainly hope not. Um, I don't do much shopping these days, but that sounds like a pretty expensive cookie. Yeah. And now, uh, and I believe that, you know, that the um, American economy now is, is the envy of the world after everything right now, correct? We are, yes, we're performing very well compared to our peer group. Yeah, pretty great. Uh, and, and is it fair to say that the stock markets are all up at record highs, right? Pretty close. Yeah. Uh, and inflation has been pretty effectively addressed. Right, it's been coming down sharply since the middle of last year. Yes, yeah, ways, we've got a ways to go on that, but we've made a lot of progress. And corporate profits are pretty robust. Is that fair? I believe it is. Okay, well, if we can agree that, and I don't understand why more people seem to be talking about a cookie that cost eighteen dollars, but uh, that seems to be against the evidence as well. But given given that, now. Uh, since things are pretty, pretty great and we're in a really great, uh, excuse me one second, uh, s place. But now I am concerned, and there's rumors going around, uh, that, that Basel, are, they're going to change and they're going to reducing the capital. And, and I guess I'm, I'm concerned about that because I don't know why we would want to, and also I want, want the record to reflect on you're much smarter than I am. But I would be concerned that things are in a really great place right now. We can all agree on that. I would be concerned uh, to change something like that because I wouldn't want to have something, again, like what happened with uh, uh, SVB. Uh, and I just wanted to get your take on, on that. Is, uh, is sure. So U.S. banks are, are well capitalized. Uh, and generally speaking, they're quite well capitalized. And we're not talking about reducing current capital levels at all. Really, in the Basel III end game, um, capital may well go up. And what we're talking about is whether the proposal that was put out uh, by the bank regulatory agencies, including the Fed, and which has now been the subject of quite a lot of comment, uh, whether, you know, what changes will be appropriate to that. That's what we're talking about. Uh, we're not talking about reducing existing capital requirements. Oh, okay. Well, that's, and, uh, and then I also want to play off of a comment made by my colleague from Tennessee, and I actually agreed with him. And he's concerned about the deficit, uh, about it's a trillion dollars for every hundred dollar days. So now, if the federal government it added three and a half trillion to the deficit by extending the Trump tax cuts, would that increase or decrease inflation? So I'm uh, I'm going to fall back on our our long time reluctance to comment on fiscal policy. We, we take your fiscal policy decisions, whatever they may be, we take them as they are, and we conduct monetary policy to achieve 2% inflation, but we don't, we don't score inflation. CBO does that, they'll, they'll make a judgment on that, but it's not something we do because, you know, we're an independent agency and that requires us to stay the heck out of politics. So I, I don't want to put you on the spot, but would, would those kind of uh, tax cuts uh, think would that help? Uh, addressing inflation or inflame inflation? I don't know what the effects would be on inflation. I do know, bro broadly speaking, um, we need to get to a place where revenues and spending are better aligned. And I think everybody knows that. And, uh, you know, I think uh, we used to talk about this a lot 10 years ago. And we're not talking about it so much anymore. That's understandable. The pandemic was a special thing. But uh, I do think it's, it would be great to get back to that on a bipartisan basis. Okay. Well, in my, I have about 30 seconds left. I just want to go on the record. I, I think you've done a really great job. And, and I think our economy, and I do agree that it is the envy of the world as, as well. And I, I'm confused that more people are uh, talking about cookies or uh, McDonald's meals and those kinds of a thing. It's not reflective on the strength of this as, as well, too. And uh, I just want to thank you for your service. Thank you, sir. Mr. Chairman. Uh, thank you, Senator Fetterman. That's the last question. And thanks for your generosity and yielding to um, colleagues who got here before, whom, whom you got here before, if I said that right. Um, thank you, Mr. Chair Powell, for joining us today and every six months, and sometimes more often, I look forward to working with you, continuing to work with you to strengthen our economy. Senators who wish to submit questions for the hearing record are due one week from today, March 14th. To Chair Powell, please submit responses to those questions for the record. 
uh, no more than 45 days from the day you received them. Uh, thank you again for your testimony. Thank you, Mr. Chairman.